this house. He's worthy. It's not for any man. It's not for anything on this earth. But it is for the mighty King, the Lord of all lords, and the Savior of our soul. We give you praise and we give you an ovation today. We're so glad to be a part of your kingdom. We're so thankful that you're in our lives. Praise God. Grab your Bibles. We're going to Matthew chapter 6 this morning. Matthew chapter 6. And it's so wonderful to feel this pulpit again today. Karen and I have been away for a few weeks. I know last Sunday we got to speak to our men. But uh, we are thankful to be back in the house of the Lord and to see all see a summer crowd. If this is a summer crowd, wow, we're going to have to do something about winter. Glad to have every one of you here, all of our guests. We're so thankful that you are with us. Uh, Justin and Mary, we're so thankful to hear that you guys are coming back home until further orders. <laughs> we, we love this wonderful couple and their family. And they have been off in Dallas doing the work of the Lord for a few years. And the, the journey there, the work is done. And now they're coming home to, for more, more orders from the Lord. I'm so thankful for the men and women who've gone out from this church. Karen and I were talking about that this week. Pastoring churches and evangelizing and, and assisting in works. We're so thankful that people are getting uh, a desire and a passion to do the will of God and the work of God and put their hands on the, on the plow that Scripture talks about. Matthew 6 is where we're looking, and uh, we're going to begin down in verse 31. Matthew 6 and verse 31. Uh, I'm going to begin in 30. It says, Thou shalt come to prayer meeting on Sunday night. I think that's what it says. Is that what verse 30 says? I, something like that. And, or else thou shalt not make it. Now we're going to verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all, after all these things do the Gentiles see. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. To me, if I was trying to tell somebody what this is all about, I would go from Acts 2 and verse 38 to this right here. And I would say, this is what you've got to get a hold of, or else it's really not going to work for you. I want to preach this morning on this huge, profound topic that Matthew was trying to unfold to us in his gospel. The key, the secret to really moving forward and living for God. Here it is. You want to know the secret? Here it is. God first. That's it. When it all boils down to making heaven and to being successful in the, on this earth in the eyes of God and pleasing Him, that is the key. God first. Lord, we're so thankful for your presence in this place. If we just come and we just get a touch or we just spend time, we have wasted an hour and a half or two hours. But Lord, we open our hearts right now. Let your word sink deep into our hearts to do what we cannot do for ourselves. Challenge us. Stir us. Convict us. Move us forward, Lord, with your word. We pray it today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. If you're holding your Bible or something else, maybe just lay it on your lap. Let's give the Lord another hand. Would you do that? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful. He's been so good to us. Amen. I don't think that there's a time that I have experienced greater hunger for God, for what God 
would like to do in this church and with his people than I'm feeling as of late. Uh, in seeking the Lord and exploring his heart, I look for things to say and messages to preach and lessons to teach that would inspire us to corporately reach for the ultimate of God's will among us. Sometimes I think that I just, if I just had a new sermon, just a new thought to express that I could light a fire in our hearts to burn for the things of God and burn for the real, genuine New Testament revival that God wants to pour out in this city. But the more that I seek God as to the best approach, the more God pulls me back to the very most important principle of the entire Word of God. So I come to this podium this morning not with a new message and not with a hidden text. And unless you are a brand new Christian, this is not something you will have never heard. But I come to you again today with the overriding theme throughout Scripture. And we have recited it so many times before, I hope that it does not lose its savor. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We'd think that the evangelization of our city and our world would be some approach or some program or some idea that's never been implemented. My wife and I are very heavily into this, this church growth theme in Scripture because we believe it's the will of God for His church to grow. All through the scripture, it is the theme uh, of the increase of his government. There shall be no end. His church is to increase. And we know the increase of the church doesn't just mean more bodies and more names. It means more souls being saved. And so we really are diving into this and we are, we are making sure that we are doing all we can do. And of course, there's so many things out there and it says you've got to in order to keep growing, you've got to keep doing more things. You've got to keep moving this level bar higher. And you've got to add more programs. And you've got to do all these things. And I, I understand those things. And we can try to find all those things and keep those approaches fresh. But new ideas and new programs are not what produce biblical revival with great anointing. But the attitude of people who are hungry for the things of God will produce the greatest spiritual things in our midst. The spirit of people who desire desperately to please God and to do His will, that is what will bring New Testament revival to this city and to this church. This isn't real complicated, ladies and gentlemen. Have, having God's will, experiencing God's will, seeking God to do what he wants to do is not real complicated. And you don't have to search real deeply in the Word of God to find what makes that come to pass. Let me tell you what brings New Testament revival to a church, what brings revival to a person's life, what makes revival possible and real in a congregation like this. It's when a whole bunch of us get together and we began to seek first the kingdom of God and everything He wants for us. When that becomes our attitude and our spirit and our frame of mind, prayer meetings all of a sudden begin to fill up and people don't have to be coerced into being faithful to the house of God. And when you sincerely begin to seek ye first the kingdom of God, Nobody will have to be persuaded to live right. To live separately from an ungodly society and world when people sincerely seek first the kingdom of God. They don't have to cheer, be cheer-led into worshiping Him and to praising Him. Nobody will have to step up and say, let's praise the Lord, somebody. But there will be a flood of praise flowing out of us when we begin to seek first 
the kingdom of God. When people sincerely seek first the kingdom, you don't have to be convinced, amen, to witness about this truth and to teach Bible studies, but we will be readily and enthusiastically telling everybody we can about the goodness of Jesus and the delivering power that's in his name and in his presence. And I feel like the Apostle Paul must have felt when he told the Corinthian church. He says, I'm not coming to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but I want there to be a demonstration of the Spirit and a demonstration of power. He says, so that you won't put your faith in the wisdom of men, but you'll put your faith in the wisdom of God. I haven't come this morning with pretty stories and anecdotes, but I have come here Sir, I've come here, ma'am, amen. I, I want to stir somebody. I've come here to rearrange the order possibly of some priorities that got them out of place until somebody decides that I am going to make the kingdom of God number one in my life, the first and the foremost thing. I'm not going to talk about it, I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to listen about it, I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to talk to somebody and tell them what I have planned or what I would like to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to make his kingdom first in my life. You give me a bunch of people who will do that and we can fill this sanctuary multiple times every Sunday until our city, amen, is shaken and stirred and they want to come to this house and find out what is going on with these people who have an anointing of God on their lives. You give me a bunch of people who seek first the kingdom of God and there'll be a praise raised in this house that begins to shake the gates of hell that releases those who are bound in their lives, that begins to disperse the miraculous among us in this place. Seek ye first. Seek ye first. If somebody would make up in their mind, it's over. I have put things before him, but I'm moving them out of the way. And I'm going to put Jesus Christ first in my life. God's waiting on a people who are not weighed down with the affairs of this world. So you're not making enough money. So what? In 150 years from now, what is that job going to matter to you anyway? So you don't have the car you want and the house you want and the dog you want because it's too expensive. Man, when we were growing up, we didn't buy dogs. We found dogs. I'm sorry, we dogs found us. And they were, they looked like they were God's reproach on earth. But we took them in and we doctored them up and fed them and they became our dogs. We didn't buy dogs. God does not want us to be all tied up with the world's affairs of people who are not burdened down with what's going on in our world, but people who have their eyes focused on a more glorious and magnificent thing, something of greater value, something of eternal worth. I tell you today that if you will seek him first, he'll turn everything around for you. He'll turn everything around for you if you will seek first the kingdom of God. If you show me some people who seek him first, I'll show you some people who aren't easily offended. I'll show you people who aren't easily discouraged if you show me some people who are seeking first the kingdom of God. I'll show you people who are stable, steadfast, faithful. I'll show you people who stand in the midst of the storm and cannot be moved off to the foundation of truth and faith and power. Those are people who are seeking first the kingdom of God. 
Tell us some secret, Pastor. Show us some trick. Pull a rabbit out of the hat. Tell us something we've never heard. Some of us have heard some of the greatest preaching, some of the greatest message on, messages on planet Earth. Teach us something we've never been taught. That type of person sounds like the Greeks on Mars Hill. They're so hungry for anybody intellectual to come their way in Scripture that they sat on Mars Hill 300 feet above all the other parts of the city. The philosophers and the doctors and those wise men of the day sat there waiting for somebody to come in and, and tickle their ears. Tell us something we haven't heard. Give us a perspective we haven't noticed yet. I don't have anything new to tell you. I just stopped by on this Sunday morning at the Pentecostals. If you want to see the glory of God, I just want to tell you, if you want to see New Testament revival, if you want to see God work in your life, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And there will be a move of God in your life like you have never witnessed before. The power of God will flow in your life and flow through your family. Coming to church and being a part of the kingdom of God cannot be a secondary thing. Christianity will not work that way. That's why people quit churches on a daily basis. You cannot put Christianity in a secondary position. You can't come occasionally to cool down the red hot fire of your guilt and expect to be a Christian. Don't go putting Christian on your application or on any of your uh, forms if you come casually into his kingdom. You are not a Christian according to the Bible terms. For a Christian is one who is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You can't put Jesus Christ in a lesser priority than number one. It does not work. He must be at the top of the list. His cause and his kingdom has got to be first. Before and above everything else in this world and in our lives. This is not something that was intended to be the sideline of our life. This is not something we do after we've done everything else. This is not just once, twice, three times a week thing. But this is something we live. This is something we eat. This is something we dream about. This is something we go to bed sleep, to sleep and hear in our minds and our hearts the things of God. This is what we talk about. This is what we think about. This is what we're all wrapped up in. This is our goal. This is our ambition. This is what it is all about. This is the cause. Seek ye first. Would you say that with me? Seek ye first seek ye first 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 we talk about fanatics out there we've seen some fanatics in their religions around the world and we don't understand them sometimes and we criticize them to think that because of their belief they would get in an airplane and be willing to die in the name of their religion. So they hijack a plane and they fly it into a building, knowing that they will die in the name of their religion. We call them religious fanatics. And there is not a bone in me or one cell that agrees with that evil that, is in, that evil intent that is in them no matter who their God is or no matter what their religion is. We don't agree with that. Agree. But can I tell you that Jesus Christ yes. summed up Christianity to be just as fanatical as any religion on the face of the earth? Glory, How can we think that those who live in false religion should have a greater consecration, Free. should have greater dedication? Free. 
should have greater fervor about their cause than we do about the true kingdom of God and about truth and about righteousness. How can I let a fanatic who is serving a false God, like Paul told them, those on Mars Hill, a dead God, how can I let them out-dedicate me to their God? This truth has changed my life. It has turned everything around for me. How can I do less than some fanatic out there who doesn't even know who God is? I'm here to convince some people to be absolutely fanatical in their living for Jesus Christ. Stir us this morning, Jesus. Stir us this morning. You know what? You ought to be happy somebody's trying to stir you because it's miserable knowing this truth and just walking as if it's some casual thing. You are miserable if that's the way you live for God. Stir me, pastor. Stir me up, pastor. Oh, hallelujah. We love you. We serve you with gladness. If this thing is going to work like it's supposed to work, then somebody is going to have to get fanatical about it. It's got to be more than life itself. It's got to be more than the next breath we breathe. We cannot be present Christians in, with some watered-down format. I don't care how many lights we put up here. I don't care what kind of paint jobs we throw on this building. I don't care what kind of modernization we bring in and all of that's fine. But brothers and sisters, somewhere we've got to be a fanatic for Jesus Christ. When we think of his goodness and all he's done for us, our souls should be ready to cry out, Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to awaken that power that's been invested in you. Nobody wants a... A, a half-hearted Christian. Nobody wants to, no, you're not going to move anybody. Nobody wants to come in here and watch somebody half-heartedly go through motions of what we call apostolic Pentecostal worship. Nobody comes here to see that. They've got that in their own churches. They've got professionalism and there's no spirit. We're trying to get professionalism because we think it'll make us better. It won't make us better. The only thing that will make us more potent in the spirit is if we get more of the spirit potent in our lives. If we'll put him first, if we'll seek him first. We have guests here. We have lots of guests here. We always do. And our prayer is that you will turn from a guest to a member. We're not going to hide anything. We'll tell you right up front. We, if you don't have a home church and your church does not preach and teach the true apostolic Pentecostal experience in the book of Acts, then you need to change churches. That might be offensive to you, but I, I, I challenge you. Come see me. Let's look at the word of God. I'll let you read the scripture and tell me what it says. Because we have nothing to hide. There is a power and an anointing that comes when you serve the true and living God. In the power of the anointed truth, he has proposed to you in his word. And I don't know where we start thinking like this, but sometimes church people start thinking that we've got to kind of calm down in order to make this more invitable to a guest that walks through our doors. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let me let you in on a little secret. Our guests have heard about you already. When our guests out there come here, it's because they've already heard that you people are wild, that you dance, that you shout, that you speak in tongues, that you run the aisles. They've already heard about you. Don't disappoint them now. We don't, need a con- we don't need to conform to this. We need to conform to that. Hallelujah. Breaks my heart to see young pastors out there trying to change everything to make it more user-friendly, guest-friendly. Let me tell you, guests are coming from dead stuff already. Why do you think they're coming? They want a move of God. They want a demonstration of the power of the name of Jesus. They want to see miracles. They want to see the outpouring of the Spirit. That's what we're in charge of. That's what we're responsible for. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Seek ye first. Seek ye first. If you try to water this down, if you try to compromise it, if you try to make it a church attending thing, it will not work. You have missed it all. Jesus Christ did not go to Calvary for that. He did not shed his precious blood for watering down his truth. I'm talking about the founder of this church. You can get mad with me, that's fine. But you know what the Lord said? He says when they reject you, they reject me because you're preaching word. You're preaching truth. So ladies and gentlemen, don't get mad at me. You turn your gaze toward the Lord and you let the Lord deal with you in your heart and let your heart be open because there's a day coming where we've got to get out of this place and this truth will set you free. Hallelujah. The founder of this church is not Daryl Weber and Karen Weber. The founder of this church was nailed to a tree. He allowed them to beat a crown of thorns into his forehead. He allowed them to strip the flesh from his back with a cat of nine tails. That is the founder of this church. And he spilled his blood for all the sins of all of humanity. This means everything to him. And it should mean everything to us. Seek ye first. Seek ye, seek ye, seek ye. When you enlisted in this, you did not enlist into something you were supposed to be casual and nonchalant about. We've got military in this place. I'm so thankful for your service. We have precious military in this place. Some of our men. We've got just about every branch of the military located in this, in this church, in the membership of this church. I'm thankful for you. But let the military teach us something. When they sign up, the staff sergeant doesn't approach them and say, man, we're so thankful that you're a part of the military. Is there anything I can do for you? Uh, oh, you don't like to get a haircut that's short and to go to boot camp? Oh, don't worry about that. No, no, no. Keep your hair you know, how long you like it. That's, what, that's fine with us. Boot camp? You don't like boot camp? No, that's fine then. Uh, look, go to, to Piccadilly and, and pick out the food you want and sit there while we're in boot camp. You just have fun. Take it easy. You're going to be all right. I'm so glad you're a part of this army to protect America. 
Oh, you want to fly a plane? Well, it's going to take, a, it's going to take years to train you to fight a, fly, a fighter plane. Uh, oh, you don't want to take years? Oh, you, you flew on a simulator on your computer? Oh, okay, okay. Well, that's fine with us. We don't want to inconvenience you. We don't want to inconvenience or make it uncomfortable for you. Or I know you've got your own plans. I know you've got your own agenda. I'm not just picking on you all over there. I don't have my glasses. I don't even know who's sitting out there. Let's, let's pick on this group right here. Teenagers. Oh, are those boots uncomfortable? You don't like fatigues? Oh, you won't, oh it's not trendy? Oh, you, won't, you want to wear something that's trendy, that's in the, in the glass at Macy's. Oh, instead of wearing fatigues in this army? Okay, that's okay. You, that's fine. That pretty, those, those high heels will work good on the battlefield if you're comfortable. If you're comfortable. If you're comfortable with that. And you don't like, you don't like this machine gun? Oh, you don't believe in shooting a gun. Okay, well that's fine with us. We don't have a problem with that. We, you know, look, you can just point at the enemy for the other people. There's one right there. Shoot him. Shoot that one. If you don't believe in care, let me tell you, when you go to the recruiter, they're real kind and real nice. We have recruiters at our church. If you go to a recruiter, they are sweet, kind. They will welcome you right in. Oh, we're so glad you were here. Oh, sign right here. Just sign right there. We'll talk about all this other stuff later. <laughs> but when you get to boot camp, you say, sir, yes, sir. Can I get a witness from any military in here? They say, you do not belong to you anymore. You belong to me. And what I say, you do. And where I say jump, you say how high. When I say walk, you say how far. You don't belong to yourself anymore. And they do that with the military. An earthly entity. And here we come into the kingdom of God and he says, be like a strong soldier, Paul says. Well, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to church three times a week. I don't want to. Can I just wear what I want to wear? Can I, I don't like to do that. I don't want to do that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. He paid his blood for your life. And I owe him everything. I owe him everything. <sighs> Praise God. It's amazing what this modern church has begun to identify itself as. We need some more fanatics. We need some more passionate servers. We need some people with a heart for the kingdom that'll put their agendas aside and put their own desires aside and their own plans and seek first the kingdom of God. I feel such an anointing behind this podium. It tells me Keep preaching. Keep speaking truth. I'm working on somebody right now. I'm working on a heart right now, he says. I'm moving and stirring because this people called by my name will do great exploits. They're going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They're going to speak to devils and devils will flee. They're going to call out my name and miracles are going to begin to work through their lives. Keep preaching truth. When you enlisted in this, he didn't break your arm and drag you to the house of God. You came willingly and that's the only way it works. And then you enlisted in this. 
You didn't enlist in something that's supposed to be down the list somewhere in priorities. You enlisted in something that takes everything. Every time I see myself giving second, third, fourth best, all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. It has to be everything. Everything you are, that's not going to win a whole lot of people if they want to keep a worldly attitude. It won't reach a whole lot of people like that. So why don't you change your message? Because it's not my message. There is something that will enter your life if you'll give it all. Give up all and He will take control and do a work in our lives. A power will resonate through your life and in your home and in your family. Everywhere you go, the power of God will work in your life. Seek ye first. Let me flip the coin over and tell you what it's really like when people do get their priorities in order. Let me tell you what it would really be like if we had a church that exemplified what Jesus told us in this text. Let me tell you a church where we put Him and His cause and His kingdom first. The glory of God would be so thick in this place that while I'm preaching, cancers would literally fall off. I'm talking about things God wants to do. Just by being in that kind of atmosphere where people were putting first the kingdom of God, diseases would begin to disappear. Crippled limbs, amen, would be healed. Physical healing miracles would take place in this congregation while we were singing praises unto the Lord. There'd be such an aroma of the glory of God in this house that, that those that were bound in their lives by things that could not, they couldn't let go, all of a sudden would fall at their feet, powerless before them, so they would be free to give God the praise and the glory and their life in honor of His goodness and mercy. You may say, that's hard to believe, Pastor. I promise you, you give me a bunch of people who seek first the kingdom of God, and it will happen. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Not my people that can barely stay awake in church. Not a group of people who are here once a week and, and count that all joy. Not people who you have to stand, amen, on your head on the platform to get their attention. Not people that are clipping their nails. Not people that are on their phone. Not people that are asleep. But people who really, 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 really live for God with all their heart. God's getting the church ready. He's getting the church ready to turn a city upside down. lift your hands would you do that would you just would you tell the Lord I surrender I surrender you shouldn't surrender to anything else but the Lord don't surrender to anything else but when it comes to him I've got to give up I've got to put my will aside my agenda why does it take so long to achieve our own agenda? Why does it seem to never work out? Why does it seem to compound more problems? It's because our agenda is under the power of our own ability. But when we step into His plan, oh, look what the rest of the Scripture says. He says, don't go after all that stuff like the Gentiles. Don't go after homes and lands and, and stuff. Don't go after all this clothing and trends. Don't live to work so you can get all the next dollar and all the bonuses and CEO and climb up the corporate ladder. He says, that's what the Gentiles do. He says, but seek 
me first. And when you do that, then you'll get all the things that you've really been seeking. But you'll get it through me. And my plan will unfold in your life. If you're a guest here today, you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is more than just coming and seeking His presence in your life. This is about getting Him inside of you. Not around you. That's an Old Testament relationship with God. We're in the New Testament. We're on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. He filled them for the very first time. He moved in to their lives, not around them. And for the first time, they had the power to power to obey His will. I can tell you that since I've received the Holy Ghost at the age of 10, it's a long time ago, but at the age of 10 since I received the Holy Ghost, I can tell you that according to statistics in my family, with my father and all of his family, I have not had near the hardship that they had without the Holy Ghost. It is turned totally around. You can say, well, we're, we're coasting, man. We're doing good. We don't have a lot of hardships. We got things in order. Let me tell you, things can look like they are in order and going just perfect. You can have the perfect little family with your little picket fence and your little barking dog and your parakeet. And 1.5 children. I don't know where the point five is, but that's what they say. That's the average American home. But let me tell you, the American dream of having everything you want is a fallacy for fulfillment. What you need more than anything is what God's Word says. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with His Spirit, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. And then you need to put Him first and foremost in your life and you talk about parting the seas for you. You talk about watching over you. You talk about blessing your family. You talk about providing for you. You talk about the miraculous or at work in your life. But to me, those are all secondary things. To me, if I have that, that's wonderful. If I don't, that's wonderful. But to me, the most important thing is that one day when that trumpet sounds... When I have put this first in my life and that trumpet sounds, it doesn't matter what kind of home I have. It doesn't matter what kind of dog I have. It doesn't matter what my income was. It doesn't matter what color my skin is. It doesn't. When I hear that trumpet sound and I have the Spirit of God in my life and I put Him first, He's going to put me first. And I'm going to get up out of this earth and I'm going to live an eternity with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. That's more important to me than anything down here. That's more important to me than houses and lands and a dollar bill. There's nothing like Jesus Christ and putting him first. And if you're living for the paycheck on Friday, you've missed it. missed it he said you've got to keep your eyes on the prize that's eternal so you made a good life for yourself so you have a good living down here what have you prepared for over there that's my question it's just like I'm waiting for you to stop talking so I can tell you what matter is that in eternity. This is the only thing that matters. This is the only thing that matters. That's why he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means staying right with God. And all of these other things shall be added unto you. Seek it first. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
nothing like truth. I don't say that with pride. I say that most humbly, that he would save me. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you let us baptize you today in the only saving name, the name of Jesus Christ. Why don't you just forget about everything else for just a minute and get ready to open your heart to the Lord. And if something is not well there, He'll take care of it. If you ask Him to forgive you, you won't have to beg Him. He's more ready than you are to tell Him. He will forgive you of the deepest, darkest things yes, in life sir. Yes, sir. that you could ever could have done. He will forgive you. And there are some things we will never forgive somebody from, and we're going to have to learn to forgive. But he never finds it hard to forgive somebody. If you are sincere and you say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. You won't have to plead with him. When he sees your sincerity that you're sorry for him, you're not going to go back out and make it a part of your life. He will forgive you right then and there. Let me tell you how important that is. Because there is not an unforgiven sin that will make it into heaven. None. Not one. Not one. Because it cannot have any fellowship with righteousness. That's why we need to get things right. No wonder Paul said, I die daily. I've got to make sure I'm right every day because I never know when that trumpet's going to sound. You've got to put him first. Seek him for New convert, I'm giving you the secret. The secret to the power of God in your life. Seek Him first. Put Him first on the list and then make all of your decisions around it. Put Him first. Put Him first. Put His house first. Put His, kingdoms, his kingdom first. Put His people first. Put His cause first. When you put His cause first, He takes up your cause and puts it first. And He'll take care of those things. That's what Matthew 6 is talking about. I'll take care of the things you're worried that you're going to lose. You don't lose anything by putting him first. You gain everything. You gain a miracle worker. You gain Jehovah Jireh, the provider. You gain the healer. You don't lose. You become a winner. You are full of triumph and victory. Thank you, Brother Bonesky, for your testimony. Nurses coming into him this week in the hospital and saying, we know you hurt. You need to take some pain medication because we've never seen anybody in your condition that doesn't have pain at a great level. And he says, I don't hurt. Prayers are going up for me. <clears throat> Would you stand with me this morning? God wants to turn us around. I challenge you through the word of God this morning. I challenge you. In the next few moments, to me, the most important part of this entire service is now. This is the most important part of this service. And this is where, because this is where we take everything God has spoken to us from the beginning of this service, even in the prayer rooms, and we bring it to a climax right now. And we say, Lord, I surrender to you. I open my life and my heart to you for your plan to carry out exactly what you want to do in me. First, Lord, I love you and I put you first. I don't know how everything's going to work out, Lord, but that's what this is all about. It's about trusting you and putting faith in you. There'll be some days where I, my eyes are filled with tears, but then there will be those days where your word says joy cometh in the morning. Lord, we know that you have a powerful, powerful plan. Help us, God to move into that plan. Help us. Make sure we're full of your spirit. Make sure we've walked through every step of repenting of our sins and 
going under the water in your name and being baptized. And Scripture tells us that's when we put you on. But Lord, there is nothing that will ever compare to when you move into our lives as we praise you and worship you. And you fill our soul with your spirit. And we speak in that heavenly language for the very first time. None of us will have ever forgotten that day if we've ever had that experience. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I open the front of this room to everybody here. We can get as close as we can. And when you come, if you would just lift your hands and just begin to cleanse your heart, just ask God to forgive you. Ask God to do something in your life. Oh, there's a cleansing power in this room right now. Would you do that? All of our guests, all of those that have come with families or friends and then our members, oh, in this place right now, you're going to connect with a mighty God who has a perfect plan, who has an anointing waiting to place on your life at another level. I've realized that many times the anointing on my life is going to determine direction for my entire family or maybe my children. It's a powerful thing that we come down here and we receive. That's it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Not my will, but thine will be done. Uh, oh, not my will, but thine will be done. Cleanse my heart, my mind, my soul. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus, of everything in me that's not well. Forgive me for doing things that are displeasing. Forgive me for the things I know about and the things I don't know that I have done against your word. Oh, cover me with the power of forgiveness right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I give to you. Oh, there's a healing virtue in this place right now. The healing hand of God that wants to heal the soul, heal the mind, and heal the heart. As we began to get a clean heart and a clean hands before Him. Come on, let there be a time of repentance in this house. Let there be a moment right now in our lives where we get transparent, where we welcome him in to do surgery on the soul. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Not my will, but your will be done. Not what I want, Lord. I love you. I love you. There's none like you, Jesus. There's none like you, Jesus. Yes. In the name of Jesus. In the name of 
Come on. 